You are watching DHTV from California State University to Vegas Hills. Hello and welcome back to Theater 100, Television, Theater, and Film. Um, today we are in our week three. Before we begin today, I just want to say a few things. Obviously, I had uh, created an announcement last week. I was very ill. Um, I was not able to be in studio to do the broadcast. I know that I put an announcement up, but just for those of you that may not have realized or, um, you know, were confused because maybe you didn't see the announcement, um, we did have a broadcast that had all the same information that you would need to pass the quiz and all of that. Um, and it was the right one for the right week, but it was from last year. So it wasn't live and um, it was still me, <laughs> but I just wasn't in studio, I was very ill. So um, a couple other things really quickly. Um, I, I'm still, because I was sick, I'm a little behind in my grading. I haven't caught up yet to grade uh, the last two um, discussion boards, so I'm getting to that. And I also know that a few of you had emailed me, I tried to go back and check this morning, um, about some problems you had with the quiz. I, I went and looked at the quiz and from what I saw, I didn't see any issues with it on my end. So I'm not sure what's going on. Um, I'm gonna try to go back on and look again today and see um, exactly who was having the problem and see again what the problems were. And maybe I need to go in and reset those few people that said that they had a problem. Um, it was more than one person. So I, again, I'm not sure. Usually if it's more than one person, that means there's something problematic on my end. But when I looked again today, I didn't see anything. So maybe I missed it. Um, but if you were one of the several people that emailed me and said you had a problem with last week's quiz that was due Sunday, um, please don't stress out. I'll try and figure out exactly what it was. And if you need to be allowed to take it late this week for whatever reason, we'll work something out and I'll email you directly to tell you exactly how we fixed it, okay? So um, that's uh, what's happening right now in terms of what's on the board. I'm gonna get to grading all those discussion boards and you guys um, will be moving on in terms of the assignments. This is week three and you do have a quiz this week as well. So make sure that you go on and take it by Sunday and then do your discussion board by Sunday as well. But those are the only two things that are due this week. All right, I do wanna remind you, we are live and online. You can always give us a call. Today we are actually live, 310-928-7330. Um, and you can also type in with a question, a comment at AskDHTVLive at gmail.com. We do have a question for the day, which you guys can go ahead and type in for, for extra credit. So, um, because you didn't get it last week, um, if you do type in today, I will be doubling up extra credit for this week. So if you type in, you'll get double the amount just to kind of make up for what you missed out on last week. Um, and here's the question. Describe in your own words one of the characteristic traits of traditional tragedy. So if you did your reading or even if you have your book right next to you, you can open it up and maybe take a look and type in. We can read some of your responses during um, the course of the broadcast, or you can call in as well. And if you do type in today, even if I don't read your comment online um, today live, you, we still take your name down, you still get the extra credit, and it will be double extra credit today, okay? All right, so today we're gonna be, we've got a, a, a really uh, rich broadcast. We're gonna be talking about the history of film. We're gonna be looking a little bit at our chapter reading today on tragedy and comedy. And then we're gonna take a quick peek right at the end. I'm hoping we'll have time to do it at V for Vendetta, a film kind of continuing on our exploration of film techniques, okay? So um, let's talk a little bit about the history of film. So in the first 25 years, film went from a novelty attraction to a major tool for entertainment, communication, and mass media. But film really did start out as being kind of just, as I just said, a novelty, a toy, right? Um, the idea of moving images started with the creation of uh, the zoetrope. And, uh, the, uh, and this was a device, maybe you've seen it, in which there is a strip of paper. And this was typically at the time it was drawn on. And it was kind of the early forms of cartooning where people would draw uh, individual images that were in slightly different positions. And then you take this strip of paper and you put it in a cylindrical a uh, shaped device, which it sets into, which has slits on the side, and then sets on a joint, and you can spin 
that cylindrical uh, device. And when you look through the slits, you see the image and it appears to be moving. And that's what a zoetrope is. There was another version that stood kind of like on a pinwheel. So rather than putting it into this device, it was uh, jointed from the back and then you spun it like a pinwheel and then you got a similar thing happening. Before that though, we knew that we could project images um, through the use of, of physics and bending light. And that was known as far back as the 1600s through a development called the camera obscura, also a pinhole camera, right? So uh, the way that this works is that what you do, and you can actually, I don't think kids do this anymore, but when I was in school, we actually made a pinhole camera. Um, here's a, a very fancy version of pinhole camera. <laughs> uh, and what you do is you have a box, a contained box. As you see, this is a, a contained box. It's dark inside. It has a looking um, aspect at one end. This has actually got a full-on lens and everything. But a, you can do this with a shoebox at home where you just basically literally take a pin and put a pin in one side, right? And then you have a viewing portion on, on the other end. And what happens is that as the light enters the tiny hole, the tiny aperture, it's focused and bent, right? So light enters through the one side. It, this is a great picture. This is the picture I, I always use in my classes. And so you can see light is coming in, right? We see the castle um, or whatever, the, the, the minaret, and it's, the light is pouring in, and now it's being focused and inverted on the opposing wall. And because the person standing inside of that box, obviously they've removed a wall so that we can look into it. But that, that box would be completely dark. And so what you would see if you were standing inside of there is this inverted, fairly clear image of what was right outside the hole, right? And this is basically how a camera obscura or a pinhole camera works. Now, obviously just looking at this image, we can see there's an immediate problem the image has been inverted, right? And that's because the way that the light comes in and is bent, it flips the image upside down. But later on in that fancy device we just saw that was up on the, behind me, that device has a, a lens inside of it. And that lens um, is there. So this one, this is a much more advanced version, right? This would actually then, because of the lens, it would flip the image to the correct way, right? So when you look inside of this device, you'd still get to see whatever was um, in front of the aperture, but you'd see a flip, the correct side up. It would be the correct side up, right? Look, here's another, right? Look, there's, he's, this is good because you can see where he's viewing, right? He's looking into it and he would see the image. And because it's got a lens on it, again, it would have flipped the image the correct way. So, What's really interesting about these as well is that this is also the beginning, and it's also why it's called a pinhole camera. Um, this is the beginnings of a camera. And in fact, a lot of cameras, I would say, not, not this one, I'll show you what I mean, not this camera, <laughs> but uh, a lot of the original cameras and even the ones that you could get not, not too long ago still operate on this basic kind of premise. The difference is that instead of just having some piece of blank board or whatever in there catching the image, you put a piece of film or you put a piece of celluloid there and it's a special type of film that actually then burns the image, the light being poured in, burns it onto that piece and then you can develop it or you know, if you're using a Polaroid, you can, it can spit out and be developed that way, right? But the idea of light pouring in and then using a, a lens to flip the image the correct way, all of that, those basic mechanics, those are were still the things that exist in a camera. If you find an old film camera at a garage sale or at a thrift store, you could open it up and see that some, these basic things are still basically in there. It operates in basically the same exact way. So... Um, there are stories of, of uh, there's a story of a Maharaja in India who, again, now we're going way back, right? This is the 1500s, that they had discovered that you could do this. And he actually had a whole room, like a giant pinhole camera, like we saw that man standing in the box, where he could bring his whole entire court in there. And they would sit inside the darkened box and there would be performers outside performing um, things in, outside of the aperture, and then they would be projected on the opposing wall, and you could see all these amazing things. 
happening. Now, of course, those things had to happen live. This was not pre-recorded. They didn't have a way to film. There was no film yet, right? Um, but it was a way to take a moving image from one place and then project it into another place. And to the people at the time, it would have been completely fascinating because you lived in a world in which the only things that you saw were the things that were happening right in front of you at the moment, right? And we live in a very different world in which just like with this broadcast, you may end up watching it two days after I was actually in the studio and it will be at, at a completely different time. I will no longer actually be sitting here. This moment will have passed and yet you will be watching something that took place in the past, right? Um, the idea of that now is so ingrained and we're so used to it that it's not surprising to us. But if we go back really, really not that long, this was a radical idea because, again, people live their entire lives only being able to see what was right in front of their eyes and happening right now. And there was no way to record or play back something that happened in the past um, at all, right? The, the way that people sent pictures to each other wasn't through their phones. If you wanted an image of somebody else, you had to hire an artist to draw an image of that person and then, you know, send it to somebody else. And it would be, of course, whatever the artist thought that that person looked like. So it wasn't the kind of objective reality that we have now. So the camera obscura, and the, also known as the pinhole camera, was the first development in kind of the technological advancements that were needed to create a moving camera. Uh, the zoetrope was next, um, which I had talked about. And then in 1878, a guy named Edward Muybridge uh, was, who's not a filmmaker, <laughs> he's actually a, a zoologist, he was working on a problem with several other people. And the question was, when a horse um, starts running, when a horse is at high speed running, does all of the horse's feet, are they, is there always one hoof on the ground? Or is there any moment in time in which a horse is running and all of their feet, all of their hooves come off the ground? Um, Again, today, a question like this seems kind of like um, rudimentary, right? Well, why wouldn't you just film the horse running like you see behind us, and then you could just pause it <laughs> or look frame by frame and just to see whether or not, you know, the feet are all off or they're not, right? Yeah, but at the time, they didn't have the ability to do that. So this is, I, I'm, I think this is actually the stills of what they did. So let's talk about what this is. What they did is they set up a series of cameras, all set on trip wires. And they had the horse run past these cameras for as many frames as you see there. So this is what, 16 frames, right? And they, the camera, the horse tripped the wire as it was going past. And it, you know, took a picture of each one of these moments. And so when they looked at it, and we can look at it now too, right? If you look in the, what should be your upper, top, upper right row, right, and we move from left to right. The first one we see that there is still one hoof on the ground, and then the next one we see there are no hooves on the ground, and in the next one there are still no hooves on the ground, and the next one we see a hoof is coming down, and in the second row we see that the hoof is back down, right, and then we go back to a fully uh, four-legged trot. But what they learned from looking at these was that the answer to the question is that absolutely yes, there is a moment in time, it's brief, when all of the horse's legs are actually up off the ground and they're sort of flying through the air, right? But they would not have been able to do this without this series of cameras that they had set up that were taking these very high speed photos um, and um, creating this series of images. Now, what you don't get from this set of, of still images is that what Muybridge eventually did after they looked at all these stills was they cut the pieces of film apart and they put them together, kind of like you see here, except that they joined all the ends together so that it was one long strip of singular film. And then they put it through a little device it's called a zoopraxiscope. And when they put it through that device and shined the light from behind it, they played a movie, <laughs> right? Now it was hand operated. It wasn't like our, you know, our cameras, well, our cameras today are all digital, but it was hand operated, didn't operate off of electricity. But he took the strip of film, he had taped it all together, right, in one long strip. 
and he put it in this and it had a, a, a lighting source behind it. I think it was a candle at first, yeah? And the film went in front and of the, so that light was shining through and you could project it on a wall and you move it like this. And if you move it fast enough, it works just like the zoetrope, right? And so what you get is instead of seeing these individual shots, it appears as though you're watching the horse run again, albeit maybe a little slower than you saw him run in real life, right? And so what he discovered, which was really interesting, was not just the answer to the question of when a horse is running, is there a moment at which all four hooves come off the ground? But what he discovered was that people were really interested in watching this horse run for a couple of seconds. <laughs> In fact, people, wanted, people who weren't zoologists, people who had nothing to do with the study of animals or gait or any of that, they wanted to come and watch this silly film of a horse seeming to run, right? A real horse, not a drawn horse, a real horse with a rider on it seeming to run. Um, and this is a moment that took place in the past, right? So at this moment, when Muybridge did this in 1878, we already had cameras. We already had the ability to take still images. But we were just right on the cusp of really figuring out how to put those still images together in such a way that we could create a moving image. Now, one of the things that what the Muybridge's um, experiment it makes very apparent to all of us is that when you watch a film, right, you're not really watching continuous movement. Um, what's on that film is not continuous movement, right? It's a series of still images that when moved, trick your eye into thinking that it is a moving image. But we can see that these are actually just a series of still images um, and that we can look at each individual, this is what we would call frame, right? We can look at each individual frame. It's why when you're watching a film even today, you can press pause, right? Because if it was a real continuously moving image, right, then you wouldn't be able to do that because it just wouldn't stop. Like, for instance, I can't press pause on my real life. <laughs> life is continuously moving. It moves forward. I can't rewind. I can't pause. I can't fast forward through it. But because our recorded images are actually a series of multiple frames, still frames, that when run together appear as though they're moving, um, we can do those things. And that was an important realization, which they had obviously realized when they were doing uh, the zoetrope and doing these hand-drawn ones, but then when they realized they could use a still camera in the same way and record real images, not just drawn images, and then play them at a particular rate and you still got the sensation of movement, that was a real breakthrough. Um, the next big leap forward was that we had to figure out a couple things. We had to figure out, first of all, remember Muybridge did this with a series of cameras. We saw 16 frames that was taken with 16 separate cameras, right? Um, ima you know, imagine if you wanted to take a film and it, lots of moving all over the place, how many cameras you would have to have all over the place to catch all the individual frames. It's completely a ridiculous and a preposterous way to do things. So we had to invent a single camera, right, that could record multiple still frames with just one camera. So that was the next big step forward. And in addition to that, we had to create celluloid film, right? We needed to create a film strip that could run through the spokes at a particular rate and could record these individual still frames at speed, right? So those two things did happen. And of course, uh, William Dick Dixon, working at Thomas Edison Labs, created the first celluloid strip. Um, the Lumiere brothers um, in France also created a, uh, a camera that could uh, record these continuous images. And when you put those two things together, you got the moving camera, right? You got this amazing invention. So now we have the film that goes inside of the camera to record the moving images, and we have the camera that has the appropriate lens and all the things in order to do that. Now these cameras were uh, manually operated. They were not operated by electricity. So if you ever see some really old images of uh, film uh, cinematographers, people who are running cameras, what you see is the guy 
um, holding the, the camera on his shoulder, usually, on one side or the other, and he has his hand cranking a wheel, right, like this. In fact, sometimes we still use that as, like, if you're playing charades, as a way to say movie, right? Of course, that I, we haven't been doing that for a very long time, but still somehow in our cultural memory, we remember that this is, you know, movie. And the reason is, is because, again, there was no electricity to move the film forward, to advance the film through. And so we had to manually advance the film through by using this crank that fed the film through in front of the lens and recorded each image. Emma Edison got a really great idea after these two things came together. He realized that there was a real taste um, throughout not just America, but the world for watching these films. And he realized that this showing these films could be commodified, right? Meaning people would pay money to go and see these films. People had loved going to see Moy Bridges' horse running. And imagine if you could charge them, you know, five cents or something to go watch 20 minutes of different, these different things, right? And so Edison really is the first person who came up with the idea of the movie theater. And he, it wasn't a permanent space at first. It was just he would go to different theaters where plays, theatrical events were happening or town halls, and he would set up his vitascope. That was his version of, um, or his vitascope, also the connectoscope um, of the, the projector. And um, he would play a series of these moving images for audiences who would pay to come and watch them. Now, these first films were not um, narrative, right? So they're not, if we went and saw one of these, we would probably be, first of all, totally bored out of our minds. Um, and it would probably be a little confusing to us because these films that they would tour around were not stories, right? That's what I mean when I say they weren't narrative. So... They were just snippets of things that people had gone out and recorded with the cameras. So often they were just kind of slices of life. There were people cooking in their kitchens. There were people walking around the streets in New York or Chicago or driving in a car or playing at the beach. And they were very, very short because, remember, it takes a lot, a lot of frames to create even one second <laughs> of, of live uh, film, right? So, you know... And if you're manually can cranking this thing, there's only so long, you know, that you can do this. And you would run out of film, right? So, you know, most of these things were not very long, a minute sometimes. I mean, that was probably pretty long, right? Um, but you would just watch a series of them. You'd go and you'd sit down for 30 minutes um, and you'd watch a series of these little clips of people gardening and people driving on a car, or people playing at the beach. And they often did things um, like driving a car or playing at the beach, things that um, a lot of people would not have experienced, right? Um, this, again, was at the, also the dawn of the automotive age. Yes, people had cars, but certainly not everybody had a car. So seeing a recorded image of someone driving in a car that made you kind of feel like you were in the car driving, um, even for 30 seconds, would have been completely exhilarating to these people. Most people, again, traveling long distances was still very hard. You would have to go by train or horse or walk, right? Like, I mean, most people did not leave um, a 20 or 30 mile radius around where they lived for their entire lives, right? So if you didn't live by a beach, guess what? You probably aren't ever going to see the ocean in your entire life. So seeing, again, a 30 second clip of people playing at the beach, or doing things in places that you had never been and probably will never go to would have been really, really exciting for these people. But these things were not narrative. They were just a bunch of these images and moments kind of smashed together, and people um, would go and watch them, and it was a great, great hit. All right. So after this, though, we certainly do get this idea that these, the moving camera can be used for more than just these kind of slice of life things, that we can actually tell stories with the camera, right? And obviously certain things needed to develop. First of all, we needed to get one that wasn't just manually operated, that could be plugged in. This allowed the camera to run for longer periods of time. Um, and you know the technology needed to evolve a little bit, but once it did, um, then we were able to start telling these kind of longer stories 
through the moving camera. Um, and, but what we still did not have were two things that we have today. And one was that we still did not have color film and we still did not have the ability to link the sound, live sound, with these moving images. Now to me, the sound thing is always the most interesting because we, at the same time, basically, that the moving camera was being developed, we had at the same time the phonograph being developed, right? So we did know how to record sound and play it back, but what we didn't have, and it was actually a fairly hard problem to solve, was the ability to sync these two things together, right? How do you sync this moving image with uh, this sound, right? Because you're gonna have to record them separately. The cameras aren't recording sound at all. They don't have a microphone or anything built into them. Um, so how do you uh, record sound and then somehow sync it up together so that it plays kind of seamlessly and isn't completely discombobulated? Um, of course, they did finally figure out how to do it, but until then, we had what we call the silent film era. So the whole first, you know, 20 some odd years that film was around, even when we started telling stories with film, the way that we did that was through silent film. So all films basically had no sound with them. If there were actors talking and we, we really, really needed the audience to know what it was that they were saying, we would have these black slides that would come in between, which we call titles, right? And they would say, write out what the important line was that you needed to know that the actor said, right? Um, and you would see their mouths moving, but again, you wouldn't hear anything. Now, do you think that, uh, you know, audience members just sat in these silent theaters just watching, you know, this very quiet experience? No, um, filmmakers immediately, even back in the Vitoscope days, immediately recognized that having some kind of sound with this experience was useful. And so what they would do is they would have live organists or live piano players playing a score to the music that enhanced the visual images, right? So if you went to a movie theater back in the silent film era, you would be sat in front of the screen, just very much like we do now, and you would watch. But at the same time, at the very front of the house, you would see an organist or a piano player who was also watching the screen and playing live a score that went with the, the film that you were watching. Now, if any of you have ever been to the Pantages, which is, um, not the Pantages, I'm sorry, to the, oh goodness, the name is escaping me. There is a, a big movie theater, it's by the Pantages, but it's, it's not um, the same. Mm, I can't think of it right now. There's one in downtown LA where you can go and see movies and Disney owns it. In fact, almost it's all Disney movies that play there now. But when you go, um, if you get there early, you can see an organist playing. He plays on this enormous organ. And if you're there like 30 minutes before the show starts, you get to enjoy his organ playing. And you might, if you didn't know this, you might wonder why is this guy playing the organ? <laughs> well, the organ is original to the theater because it used to be an old school movie theater. And so when the old silent films would play on the screen, they would, the organist would be there and he would be playing along the score, right? Now, obviously, it's just this kind of um, appendage that's kind of this callback to an older era, and so he only plays at the beginning. It's an amazing organ, too, because it lowers into the, to this um, kind of elevated stage that the screen is on, and then it comes out kind of magically out of the out of that area. But it's a really fun thing if you ever go see, I'll have to try and remember the name of this movie theater. I can't think of it at the moment. Um, but if you go there, it's on Sun Hollywood Boulevard. Um, and you see any movie there, again, the 30 minutes before they play, uh, they have organ music. And that's why the organ is there, is to play along with the, the silent films. Um, so there were all kinds of different also special effects that started developing as film became more advanced and they were trying to tell different kinds of stories. They realized that they could 
Um, they didn't have a, a dolly system. Remember in our very first class, we talked about tracking and dolly systems. They didn't have the ability to really move cameras around like that. Um, so if they wanted to do a big wide panorama shot, sometimes they'd get the camera onto a train and they'd set it on there and the, as the train is moving, you know, they'd get this really long wide shot. They also learned that you can use something called a jump cut to um, create special effects in film. Now, you can do this at home with your video camera, right? If you have just the simplest uh, film editing software on your phone, which most of us do, um, what you do is you take, um, and this is what a jump cut is and the way that they would use it back then, it hasn't changed at all. You film a sequence, right? And when you get to the part where you want the magical effect to happen, right? You stop the film, you stop, so you take, you stop the shot, and then you put in whatever it is that's supposed to appear in the next frame, and it's there, and then when you start running for the next shot, the thing is there. So for instance, here's some of the things that they would do. So they would have a shot running, and maybe there's supposed to be a genie that appears out of some smoke, right? So they're running the shot, the guy's rubbing the lamp, right? And they already have set up some effect where smoke is going to come out and there's all this smoke. And in fact, the actor who's even rubbing the lamp is engulfed in smoke and they press stop, right? They stop running the camera. They cut, basically. Now, somebody dresses a genie, runs into the frame and is standing in the smoke. And now we're going to press play again, right? And now the next frame is gonna have the genie in there. But when I watch it as an audience member, I will not realize that something has stopped, right? I will just simply watch the this frame run into the next frame and to me, it will appear as though the genie just magically appeared out of nowhere, right? Again, you can do this with your phone at home. You can do all kinds of things like this. If you just have some really simple editing software on your phone, you can, you know, snap your fingers and then press stop and then put the pen there. <laughs> when you press play again, and you marry those two things together, the, the pen will appear to magically appear into the shot, right? So they figured out all these different kinds of little tricks that they could do to make um, the magic of film, right? Now, of course, we have, we're super advanced because everything's digital. We can do digital composites. We can digitally put things into films. Um, we can take things out, right? So there's, obviously, we've, we've become very, very advanced, but some of these techniques um, are still used even today in the way that uh, we work. Also, single frame animation evolved um, at the beginning of the, the 1900s. Um, the idea that we could take that original zoetrope idea, we could hand draw and do single shots. And then when we play those shots together, we get an animated film. And of course, Walt Disney is one of the, the, the big giants in the film, uh, in the world of uh, Near, uh, sorry, animation and long form animation, feature film animation. So the techniques of film continued to develop and to create a uh, film in it itself started to create its own language, its own way of communicating story through the use of different types of shots and the where we place the camera and all of those things. People became celebrities starting all the way back in the silent film era, right? People like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin, Clara Bow, Douglas Fairbanks, all these people, they made their careers in the silent film era. And quite unfortunately, when we finally added sound in, some of these people also lost their careers because their voices were not pleasant to listen to. <laughs> they were nice to look at, but not pleasant to listen to. And, um, and so some of those celebrities, as we moved from um, a completely silent film era to what we call the talkies um, did not come along with that. Charlie Chaplin is actually one of the few people that was uh, consistently uh, a big celebrity throughout this an entire period. Um, originally, a lot of the filmmakers were actually, this might be interesting to you, were actually based on the East Coast in New York. That was kind of where a lot of those developments had happened. Um, uh, but because Edison was also on the East Coast and Edison had patents for so many of the technologies that was used in the film industry from the projecting camera to the, the standardized film strip itself to the moving camera, all of those things. Um, and so if you wanted to do a film in New York, it became very, very costly because you were paying 
all this money uh, to, to Mr. Edison all the time. Um, eventually, filmmakers moved to uh, Southern California because Edison ha didn't have a monopoly over there. And also, one of the, the great things and why Hollywood has flourished here is because we have such great weather. Um, remember that at the time, there was no such thing as all this stage lighting, right? There was no such thing as really, really high luminosity um, lamps for filming inside, for filming at nighttime. So in order to be able to film for as many days as possible, you want to be living in a place that has a lot of sunlight and good weather a lot of the time. And of course, LA is the perfect place for that. <laughs> so, so many of these studios moved over here because they realized they had way more days that they could film um, and, and then therefore they could produce more, um, more movies for people to watch. The original studios, of course, were designed in such a fashion to utilize and make the most out of the natural sunlight. Those old studios, actually, most of their ceilings were entirely skylights, meaning they were glass to let the sunlight pour in so that they could, again, they could, this maximize the filming too, right? So maybe it is a little rainy outside and we can't have all of our equipment outside, but it's still sunny. Um, as we know, we can get that in California. And so we can still film inside today. Um, it also allowed for them to, you know, create these elaborate sound stages and do things um, in, in, on interior sides without worrying about um, sound corrupting the film or other things happening. So, um, there again, film continues to develop in terms of the type of shots and the types of special effects that we can use. Eventually, we do get sound in 1927. The first ever talkie um, sound that in, uh, film that incorporated sound is called the Jazz Singer. It had um, Al Jolson in it, and it is um, what's really interesting to me about this film is because we do consider it the first talkie, but the, there's really only 10 minutes of synced sound at the end of that film. So if you ever watch this film. 90% of the film is actually silent. It's not until you get to the last 10 minutes of the film that you actually get synced sound and images. And it's for Al Jolson's final performance at the very end of the film, which, by the way, just a warning in case any of you do decide to watch it after you get done here today or at another point, um, the big moment in that film is actually Al Jolson singing in blackface. So it is racist, yeah. Um, but uh, it, it is interesting to look at just in terms of it being the very first, you can find it on YouTube, that last little bit um, of being, again, the very first film that included sound, synced sound, and it's synced even now. You can watch it and it's like they did a really good job of figuring out how to sync the sound um, and the moving images. So talkies took over Hollywood by 1929. Um, basically, everything had moved over to being um, a sound film. And this really um, is the thing that ushered in the great golden age of Hollywood. Most of the films that we love and um, from the golden age come from this time period with great stars, of course, being developed out of this period like Clark Gable, um, Audrey Hepburn, Humphrey Bogart, Garbo, um, and in the 1930s, Shirley Temple. So, um, also, this allowed for us to do um, musicals, right? So now suddenly, not only could we have sound in our films, but why not utilize it to the, the most and make musicals? And that is exactly what had happened. Um, the studio executives knew that musicals, in terms of what was happening on Broadway or what was happening um, in the theatrical world, were some of the biggest drawers of audiences. And so why not take that same formula and just do it in a cinematic way. And so they did, they, they you know, did their own original musicals as well as taking and adapting Broadway musicals to the cinematic world. We also got horror films, Dracula um, and Frankenstein in 1931, King Kong in 1933, and a, a ton of the Westerns also were shot during this time period. Uh, we got the genre of gangster films like Little Caesar and The Public Enemy in 1931. And then, of course, going back to how animation really started flourishing during this time in 1937, we got Snow White. And the reason why Snow White is important 
is simply because it was the first feature length film that had that was fully animated, right? If anyone knows anything about animation and the process, um, hand drawn animation, of course nowadays it's a little easier, but then just a laborious, laborious process to do this because every single frame has to be drawn, right? And then captured with a camera and then we put the next one on and we, it's, you know, and the guys are with a camera. And because Disney wanted to do this really kind of almost crazy idea, make a almost two hour film with only just hand drawn images, which <laughs> is just thousands and thousands and thousands of images. They also developed um, techniques for making it easier. Um, the multi-layered um, shot was developed through Disney where they had multiple layers of background to create depth in the animation, right? Um, they created glass pieces that allowed uh, the images to slide in and out smoothly as they're taking these, these images so they can move as quickly as possible through photographing each frame. There were just a lot of developments that happened that Disney pioneered because he had this idea of wanting to make this feature length film. And of course, Snow White was wildly popular and people loved it and even today it's a classic film. Well, the crescendo of this, this period probably happened somewhere around 1939. Um, 1940 with Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz, these two kind of seminal films. One of the things that makes each of these really important is that we also see the incorporation of color film, right? Um, Gone with the Wind is completely in color. The Wizard of Oz has this wonderful moment where we showcase our ability to finally use color film in that the film starts out in black and white and then when Dorothy gets to Oz, we switch to this wonderful, vibrant, colorful world, right? Um, these are, you know, we see here in both of these films that the narrative process, the way of storytelling within film has fully developed. We have a clear sense of how to cut scenes, how to do two shots and single shots, how to tell a story narratively through the use of camera work. Um, and these are really two really high marks in terms of um, building to this point of being able to tell this really fantastic story. Um, with all the elements in place, color film, sound, and a fully developed visual narrative process. The 1940s brought World War II, and um, this really kind of changed the way that film was being used. The, the films needed to be patriotic. Um, also, people wanted to kind of, you know, they actually had, we kind of skimmed over this, but they had just kind of, they were coming out of the Depression, and we now we're at war with, you know, there's this giant war going on. And people wanted to escape when they went to the movies. They wanted to experience something that wasn't like real life. And so we get a lot of films that do that for us. Yankee Doodle Dandy and Casablanca in 1942, Watch on the Rhine, 1943. Um, but also Citizen Kane in 1941, which if you've never seen Citizen Kane, it's still widely regarded as one of the greatest films of all time. Um, I think, you know, there's room for debate in there as to whether it is, but certainly when you look at the canon of film um, and you look at its development up into this point, uh, Citizen Kane does so many things, amazing things, genius things, right, um, that nobody had thought of doing before, as well as the story itself. is just timeless and, and amazing and still resonates even today. Um, it's a Wonderful Life in 1946, in the best years of our lives, all of these films came out in the 1940s, right? In the 1950s, that brought us the Cold War, um, the HWAC hearings, the House uh, hearings on un-American activity led by uh, McCarthy, and we ended up having a kind of crisis in Hollywood where we um, had the accusation by um, there was a belief by Senator McCarthy and others that the communists were trying to infiltrate America by using Hollywood as a propaganda machine. And so Hollywood was one of the first places where Senator McCarthy kind of focused his lens um, trying to root out communism out of America. And unfortunately, a lot of people were blacklisted. Um, someone like... Uh, Chaplin was blacklisted as a result of this. Another person you might not know, but there's a wonderful movie about Dalton Trumbo, who was a writer, um, was blacklisted and um, not, what does that mean? It meant that they, you got put kind of on an unspoken list that meant you are a communist and not someone, un-American and not someone that should be able to work, 
right? And so people lost their jobs and they were not able to do the thing that they loved because of a fear of communism infiltrating um, America. Um, but the other thing that this whole era brought us was the B film. Um, and this is kind of like this um, very over the top theatrical kind of horror sci-fi movie in which uh, we are as often, you know, the kind of fear of invasion. And of course, as you can see at the time, this is what, you know, the undercurrent of society was this fear that we were secretly being invaded by communists. And these films really tapped into that feeling and they became um, their own sort of genre and um, very, very popular films like Bod uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers and War of the Worlds are really clear examples of this style and this narrative. Of course, the 1950s also brought us television, which um, really changed the dynamic of how Hollywood made its own films because when people can be at home and watch on their little screen, then what is going to take you out of your house? We're kind of going through a similar thing right now, right? Why would you want to leave your house to go to a movie theater, right, and pay money when you can sit at home and watch it for free? Um, so films really kind of had to change the way they approached filmmaking. It caused them to um, become much bigger, more spectacular, more special effects, all those things, things that you wanted to go and see in a large format in a movie theater and maybe weren't as best served on your tiny screen at home. So we get really big budget films, epics like The Robe in 1953, um, The Ten Commandments, Ben-Hur, Oklahoma, Around the World in 80 Days, The South Pacific, and Cleopatra, all of these really sprawling epic films, musicals, again, these things that you want to go uh, draw audiences to go and see them inside of a movie theater and this really big screen because they have that epic quality and it's not going to be the same if you watch it at home. Of course, Disney continued coming out with their own films, such as Peter Pan, Sleeping Beauty, Lady and the Tramp, and other classics. Um, in the 1960s, we would uh, change and we would begin to focus on family themes. We got Mary Poppins, My Fair Lady, The Sound of Music. But also another thing happened here, and that was that there were a lot of foreign filmmakers that got into um, the filmmaking business and started gaining traction. Um, Truffaut and Godard, Fellini... Um, these other filmmakers um, from Italy and France and other places beginning to get traction on the international scene and sort of um, up into this point, really the people who had been dominating it had been the Americans, right? So the fact that we had some international voices in there gaining some traction was a big change. The Bond films also became very popular during this era. And then also others, Kurosawa, a Japanese filmmaker who's amazing if you've never seen anything that he's done. He's an, uh, just an amazing filmmaker. Um, and Satyajit Ray in India. So um, all these things would add to a new and developing voices that were being allowed into the world of cinema and these different perspectives that were coming in. The 1970s is often called the age of new Hollywood. It changes from classical cinema with twist endings to uh, featuring morally questionable characters, scrambled plots, and all of that really begins kind of with film no noir as a seed, which happened years before. Film noir coming from noir novels, right? Um, and then moving into the world of cinema and then later kind of influencing film in the 1970s. Also, there was a whole slew of new directors that had really distinctive voices and were kind of moving film in really new directions, doing things with it that had never been done for them before. Some of these, hopefully, you'll be familiar with. Martin Scorsese, who just is nominated for Best Picture for The Irishman. Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Brian De Palma. And they had what has come to be known as an auteur approach to filmmaking, which basically... Uh, said that they were going to use their own personal um, style, their own personal um, vision for how they were going to tell these stories and move away from what had been kind of standardized as this classic approach to film, right? That, you, you know, you had to do these kinds of shots and this is the way you kind of put films together and this is the way you told the stories. And the auteurs really kind of broke out of that system and said, no, I just kind of want to do my own approach and I want to have my own stamp on it. Part of what happens when you do that is like when I mention these names to you, people like Martin Scorsese or Francis Ford Coppola or Steven Spielberg, um, 
because they're so, so individualized in the way that they approach film, when you watch these films, um, even if you, know, you didn't know that it was by Steven Spielberg, oftentimes, um, at least if you're a film aficionado, you look at it and you're like, oh, this is, this is a Spielberg film, right? It just has such a, um, a visual lexicon that's unique to these individual filmmakers that um, they really put their stamp on these films and they, you get a sense of their entire tone and personality comes through the process of the filmmaking itself, right? So, um, you know, some of the great films out of this, this from these guys are Scorsese's Taxi Driver, Coppola's The Godfather films. You saw some of these cycling behind me, Spielberg's Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and George Lucas's Star Wars, which led to the creation, of, well, the creation, it uh, led to the idea of the blockbuster film, right? So, um, meaning that you create a film and you kind of have um, a a few high budget films, right, that you're going to put a lot of money into, but they're going to be really, really popular when you release them and you're going to make, you know, tons of money back on them. So you're okay spending a lot of money on these few films, even though you're producing maybe, you know, 20 or 30 films in the year as a studio, there are these three or four films that you think are going to be hugely popular. And so you're going to pour uh, a lot of money into those um, because you know you're also going to get that return back. We also started branching out and got a lot of world cinema in the, the 70s. Bruce Lee brought greater realism to martial arts films. He also became a cultural icon. Jackie Chan bought, brought comedy in the 80s. And there was, of course, a boom in Bombay in the late 70s and early, early ladies in terms of filmmaking, which generated uh, Bollywood, which if anyone knows anything about filmmaking, I don't know if this is true now. China and other places might be making more films now. But as of, I think, at least last year, Bollywood or India was still the single country that generated the most number of films every year. They create the highest number of films. Now, we don't usually see any of those films because they're generated for an Indian um, audience and for, for um, people who speak Hindi primarily. Um, but um, actually, if you have Netflix now, you can see some of them. They've brought some of those films in. Uh, you know, India has been a powerhouse of filmmaking since the late 70s and early 80s, and they generate a massive amount of content, um, and they have a massive audience that, that gobbles all of that up, and they're, you know, they've got a lot of great stuff that comes out of India. In the 1980s, we got the home VCR, right? People could now, again, watch these movies inside of their homes, and they didn't have to wait until Thanksgiving, you know, turn to Channel 5 and watch E.T. <laughs> you could go to the video store, and you could grab this video, and you could watch E.T. whenever you want it. You could rent a video um, and play it on your VCR. And so this became um, a, a big thing, and um, it was another way for um, film studios to generate uh, revenue right? So not just box office profits, but afterwards the selling of the VHS video and then the, the royalties from the rentals and all of that. Um, in the 1990s, we got uh, commercially successful independent films. Independent films were huge throughout the 1990s and the early 2000s. And this really allowed for a lot of experimentation to happen in films like Pulp Fiction, um, also big animated films um, that Disney had a resurgence in the early 1990s with films like Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Aladdin, and then of course adding Pixar on at the end where we had computer animated films with Toy Story, which was the first feature length digitally animated film, right? Um, also we got DVDs, we got rid of our VHSs and we moved to DVDs, um, which provided higher quality and um, more stable images. If any, I'm sure that nobody watching right now probably has ever watched a VHS movie in their life, but one of the things that would happen, and you didn't even have to play the movie that often, is that if you played the, because it was just a magnetic strip that the, the film was recorded on, those degenerate pretty quickly. And with each time you play them, you get a little bit of loss of, of quality. Um, and they're also sensitive to light and heat and all kinds of things, right? 
So, you know, as a kid, I grew up with VHS and, uh, you know, you would play a video that you really liked a lot of times, but, you know, on the 20th or 30th time that you played that video, you had the image was, you know, starting to get fuzzy and white noise was coming in, you know, static basically. And at some point, you just really couldn't play the video anymore. Sometimes, you know, physical things would happen to it and it would get messed up inside of the the player and you'd have to throw it out and get a new one. So obviously all of those things went away with the invention of DVDs and then of course even more so now with streaming, yes we have to deal with buffering and, and all those things and not having fast streaming but you never have something, uh, you ne once you buy your thing on Apple I, you know, Tunes or wherever you buy it, um, it's always yours forever and you're never going to have to throw it away, of course, until there's some new technological advancement. All right. Um, nobody has typed in in the first hour for their double extra credit. I'm completely shocked. We are going to go to a break in just a minute. It's going to be a 10-minute break. Um, and when we come back, we're going to look at tragedy and comedy and hopefully get some time to dip in a little bit into V for Vendetta. We'll see. Um, but uh, in the meantime, maybe think about uh, this question, describe in your own words one of the characteristic traits of traditional comedy. And when we come back from the break, maybe some of you will want to type in or call in and answer that question for double extra credit. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're going to take a ten, quick 10 minute break and when we come back, we'll move on. All right. You are watching DHTV from California State University to Megas Hills. Yo, I feel like before, I was just by myself. I'm not gonna get distracted by anything or anybody. I'm just here on a mission, that's what I thought. But I started to realize that I don't wanna be just a student, I wanna be like a motivation to somebody. I love my job. I wanted to be able to have a place, like a, a laboratory on campus that people could actually get hands-on into making a difference. The CSU DH Urban Farm is one part of the operation that we're building here. We have energy systems, we have food systems, we have transportation systems, and we're trying to make them more sustainable. I started to volunteer a lot to just let myself get exposed to different things that I wasn't used to, to get out of that comfort zone. One of the reasons I teach here is because my own artwork has a really strong tie to the LA community. There's some really amazing artists who live and work in South Los Angeles. They want to work with our students and when they actually meet these artists, it's like very transformative. They start to realize that their time here at CSUDH isn't about finding something new to make art about. It's actually about how to shape and engage the community with the things that are already important to them. I want to become an orthopedic surgeon, and right now I have an internship at Kaiser, and that's one of the things I want to do in the outside world, is just to help the community. I'm not only changing my life, you know, but I'm also changing other people's lives. That is that thing of like, I want to get up and work hard to change things for the future, to make things better. I want to interact with my community. How does this small system that we're building out here relate to the larger regional system? Because ultimately that has to happen for the entire city, the entire country, the entire world. My name is Devin. My name is Johnny. My name is Jenny and I'm a Toro.
I am a first generation student and I never really thought that what I was doing was important. Without the help of everybody that's mentored me so far, I don't feel like I would have gotten as far as I have. <laughs> For me, that's the best thing about being here. Seeing them achieve things that they never thought they could. It was a long road to get my bachelor's degree. I took a very untraditional path. I was working, supporting myself. I didn't know what I didn't know. And I made it a point to introduce myself to all of my professors while I was here. Somebody who's already at this place where you want to be is recognizing something within you. And it, it gives you the, the permission to believe in yourself. Our research focuses on the intersection between psychology, technology, and media, how people's media consumption can affect them. I think it's remarkable that CSUDH has been represented on 60 Minutes on national media. To me, that points to the amazing cutting edge research that we're doing. If it wasn't for professors like Dr. Shabir, who had honestly bigger dreams for me than I have for myself, I wouldn't have had one of the most rewarding experiences, not only at CSUDH, but also in my life. The year after I graduated, I got recruited to Facebook and I thought nobody's ever gonna ask me about the degree. That was the first question they asked. Ideas can really blossom here. For instance, joining a lab or having an idea for some program that you wanna start. We really allow those kinds of ideas to grow. The feeling I had when I was here as a student was that I could do anything. How can I share that experience that I had here with all the other students now. Mentorship in that sense is incredibly important because I started to believe in my own ability and that definitely helped me, I suppose, become the person that I really am. For me, success is reaching the point where I can become help to other people. And now I'm heading off to my PhD. My name is Brie. My name is Nancy. My name is Amaranta and I'm a Toro. with negativity. Instead, surround yourself with people who share the same goals as you. If you believe it, you can do it.
You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Hey guys, welcome back to Theater 100. We just had our little break. There was a little technical difficulty, so we just moved to the uh, blank screen there, but that was our full 10 minute break and we're going to uh, move on with the rest of our lecture for today. So in this last part of class, we're gonna be talking about your reading for this week, which was tragedy and comedy. Tragedy and comedy are the two original um, large genres under which everything else really has fall, falls under in terms of um, types of uh, theater that exist, but also types of films or, or plays, television shows, all of those things. They are the original two. And uh, they were around all the way back during uh, the Greek period and evolved um, out of that period and then were clarified by people like Aristotle, whom we'll talk about in a moment. Obviously today we have lots of different genres. We don't just have tragedy, which we would now call drama um, and comedy. We actually have lots of subgenres. We have mixing of genres. We have all kinds of things. We'll talk about that a little bit towards the end of today. But, you know, these two broad categories are foundational, and so it's worth it for us to kind of think about them and think about uh, what they mean and uh, what are the criteria in terms of how these things fit together. They're so foundational to the theater that if you look behind me, one of the things that is uh, clearly identifiable when we talk about theater is the you know, happy mask and the sad mask, right? And the happy mask and sad mask represent the two broad genres of tragedy and comedy, right? So what is tragedy? Let's start with that. Tragedy is, um, again, today we would call this drama, but there's a really a much more specific definition that the Greeks had for what a tragedy is. And um, we're going to break it down a little bit. The word itself is derivative. It comes from the Greek word that means goat song. Um, and the textbook defines it as one of the most fundamental dramatic forms in Western tradition. Tragedy involves a serious action of universal significance and has important moral and philosophical implications. Following Aristotle, most critics agree that a tragic hero or heroine should be an essentially admirable person whose downfall elicits our sympathy while leaving us with a feeling that there has in some way been a triumph of the moral and cosmic order which transcends the fate of any particular individual. The disastrous outcome of a tragedy should be seen as the inevitable result of the character and his or her situation, including forces beyond the character's control. So you can find that in your textbook in the chapter Tragedy and Comedy. But, you know, what is it saying exactly? Well, it's playing off of what Aristotle said tragedy was. Aristotle, a famous Greek philosopher who wrote the Poetics. Um, and uh, Aristotle basically laid out what are the rules for tragedy and what are the rules for comedy and what makes a good play, right? And we are going to talk about a little bit of those. But what he said, and it, again, it piggybacks well, the textbook definition is piggybacking off of Aristotle. Tragedy is the imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and of a certain magnitude, right? So I like to, you know, the textbook definition is really good. It's very complicated. So I, I actually think that Aristotle's is a little bit more concise. And let's think about what he says and how it applies. So tragedy is the imitation of an action. So already what Aristotle says is that when we're looking at theater, when we're looking at you know, even film or television, what we're looking at is an imitation of an action, right? There is a sense that this is pretend, this is make-believe, this isn't really happening right here, right? And in fact, we engage our willing suspension of disbelief so that we do experience it as if it were happening, but we also know that it isn't, right? And that's a really important part. Um, it, is a, it is not, we would not consider it uh, theatrical or even okay, even though it would have been okay a few hundred years ago, um, to go to a gallows site and watch people get hung, right? Watch people literally lose their lives and be executed, even if they were deserving of that punishment for whatever reason. That would not be considered entertainment to us. Now, like I said, we could go back a few hundred years, 
even here in the Americas, and we could find that that was actually something that people went and did. But they still wouldn't consider it theater, right? That's an actual thing that's happening, and it has ramifications in a different way than a theatrical experience. So the fact that something is imitative, that it is simply pretend, theatrical in nature, is an important aspect of the definition, right? That action should be serious. So in Aristotle's time, they believed that tragedy should be 100% serious. There should be no tomfoolery in tragedy, right? If something is a tragedy, it's all the way a tragedy. There's no funny lines. There's no funny moments that happen in it. There's nothing silly or ridiculous about it. It's completely serious in nature and that that tone pervades the entire piece. Now, nowadays, when we look at drama, we have such uh, genres as things called dramedies, right? This is a drama comedy. We have such genres as things called black comedies, which are comedies that are kind of serious too sometimes, right? We have all these mixing of, of styles and genres that we did not have um, in the Greek period. In fact, that would have can be considered bad and not very good theater to mix genres in that way. So the Greeks thought that, as Aristotle stating, that if something is a tragedy, it should be serious in nature, and that it should be wholly and consistently serious. We don't have moments of lightness in something that's supposed to be tragic in nature. It should be complete, meaning that it should have a clear beginning, middle, and end, right? We should have a clear moment in which the, the hero is put into a tough situation and they have to struggle to get out of that situation. And at the end, the, there is a clear answer to how they got out. Now, in Greek tragedy, <laughs> that often means the hero dying um, or has suffering a really, really terrible fate, sometimes worse than death, right? Um, but at the end, it's really clear that the struggle is over. It's complete. And it's not just going to kind of continue on for forever into eternity. It ends here. And the story has a sense of completion. And it is of a certain magnitude. So your textbook goes on to elaborate on that and says, instead of a certain magnitude, it calls it a universal sig significance. Um, and, and that's in some ways what uh, Aristotle means. Two things. Aristotle means that tragedy should have high stakes, meaning when we watch these stories, that the stakes, what is at, um, possible for the protagonist or the hero to lose, what is potentially um, something that they might lose, the, there is a, it's high, it's very important. Oftentimes, it's their very life that's on the line, right? That's how high the stakes are. But even if it's not that their life is on their line, it's still something that's incredibly, incredibly important. Right? Something that if they don't get or they lose is going to change the entire direction of their life from now into you know, the end. So when we say a certain magnitude, we mean that it's very high stakes. The other aspect is that it should have a universal component. Right? It should be relatable, that lots of people can look at it and there's something very universal. There's a universal message. There's something in there that lots of people can relate to. Right? Aristotle also said that it should be concerning the fall of a man whose character is good, whose misfortune is brought about not by vice or depravity, but by some error or frailty, right? So again, the Greeks believed that the main character, the protagonist of the story, should be an essentially good person, um, and that the bad things that they end up suffering isn't because... Um, they're bad people, it's because they have some innate flaw um, that has kind of gotten them into this situation. Sometimes we call that their fatal flaw, right? Or their tragic flaw. It's the thing, the reason why we sometimes call it their fatal flaw is because in Greek drama or Greek tragedy, it often ends in the death of the protagonist. So for instance, in Oedipus Rex, which is uh, one of, you know, in the great canon of Greek works, the tragic flaw was that Oedipus was um, was quick to anger, right? He had a hot temper, and he was also arrogant, right? And even though in certain situations those attitudes, they actually got him, that they're the things that also made him king, but when taken to the extreme, to the exclusion of other character traits, they become the thing that also becomes his downfall. And of course, in Macbeth, it was his ambition that caused his downfall. Again, ambition, not a bad thing. 
But if you take it to it, it's, it's extreme, then it can also be the thing that causes you to um, falter. Aristotle says that it should also have events arousing pity and fear wherewith to accomplish the catharsis of these emotions. So that these dramas or tragedies should elicit a sense of empathy, connection with the protagonist um, from the audience that allows us to experience the protagonist's um, fear and tragedy and to pity that person and therefore that we release those feelings and we don't have to deal with them at other moments in our life, right? That it should, you know, I think a simple way to say it is that when we watch these stories with other people, that we have a shared sense of compassion and grief for our main characters. And we also, we experience that through empathy, right? So we're experiencing it together as a group because we're all watching it. But we're also experiencing it. It's not just sympathy. It's not just this feeling of like, wow, I feel sorry for you. It's like, I actually genuinely feel sad as well because I'm so connected to you as a protagonist. So he also said that there should be heightened language. And this was something that, of course, was, was followed for many, many hundreds of years, um, thousands of years afterwards, that when we went to see a theatrical experience that we um, had heightened language. Um, probably the thing you're most familiar with is Shakespeare, the heightened language of Shakespeare. Maybe you know, maybe you don't, but most people that lived in the Elizabethan age did not talk, talk like a Shakespeare play. <laughs> that was very elevated language. People didn't just walk around talking in iambic pentameter um, and using these words to, to say little, nothing of the fact that Shakespeare invented a ton of the words that he used in his plays, right? So people wouldn't have even been familiar with them. He was just making them up. Um, so the language that we see in Shakespeare's plays and in the Greek plays and in all the plays, basically all the way into the 20th century, always involves some element of heightened language. And that would mean that they were either, um, you know, heightened in the sense that their, people were using words and speaking in ways that normal people didn't speak, all the way to the extremity, which is that you have structured language that is almost more akin to poetry than it is to normal spoken language. And again, we see that in Shakespeare's works, all of his original stuff. It wasn't until later that he started prose writing, which doesn't have as much structure. But uh, his original works are all very clearly written in iambic pentameter, and some of them even in rhyming couplet, right? And then we go even further afield into the French neoclassical period. The French were writing in something called a quatrain, which is um, their version of the iambic pentameter still in very heightened language. So we get that really for a very, very long time, all the way until the realists appear in the 20th century. Even today, when you go and watch plays, there are some plays that you see where you're like, boy, these people really speak very well. <laughs> Most of us don't speak you know, as clearly or as eloquently as the people that we watch on stages or even in films. You know, sometimes people, you know, because this language that has been written on the page for these actors to stay has been labored over and shaped in a really specific way that, you know, most of us in our everyday lives, we don't do that. We just say the words that, you know, come to our head. So even now, even though our, the language we see today in film and television and all those things are less heightened than what we would have seen in the Greek period, we still have a sense of heightened language um, and heightened drama and heightened structure that exists in our film and television. Um, there is an argument that tragedy still exists today um, in um, our films and in our, um, our plays. An example of a modern tragedy would be Arthur Miller's uh, Death of a Salesman. He felt that we could still write modern tragedies, but that, of course, the rules would be slightly different. His definition was that a modern tragedy would be where the main character is willing to lay down his life to secure his sense of personal dignity. In fact, many people argue that the play we're going to look at in a week or so, Raisin in the Sun, is also another example of modern tragedy. Um, where we see the main character um, there who really struggles with, again, his sense of personal dignity and his uh, willingness to sort of almost do anything, break all the rules, um, practically die in order to secure um, a sense of personal dignity and respect within the world. 
What are some other elements that exist in tragedy? Well, subtext is one of the things that we see inside of a modern tragedy. Not so much necessarily in the tragedies of old in the Greek times, but in a modern tragedy, we definitely do see subtext. And these are emotions, tensions, and thoughts not expressed directly in the words of the play, but revealed by nonverbal movements of the actor. And that was the definition given by Stanislavski because it is a very modern thing. Um, basically means all the things that the characters aren't saying, right? So what's happening underneath? You know, I might walk up to somebody one day and say, wow, that's a really nice shirt, right? But you can tell from the tone of my voice <laughs> and my body language that I don't actually mean that it's a really nice shirt. I mean, it's a really ugly shirt, right? So that's subtext. What are the things that the words might be saying one thing, but the tone, the paraverbal communication, all that might be saying something completely different or have a completely different objective or goal than what the words are saying, right? Um, this is something that was a, a, a modern, um, in, I don't want to say invention, because people do this all the time, right? You do these things all the time. You say one thing and you mean another. You say one thing, but underneath there's some other things going on there. Um, but it was not considered something that you should play on the stage for hundreds and hundreds of years, because it was felt that whatever happens on the stage, actors should be saying all of it, right? There should be no question in the audience's mind as to what's happening. And if there is, then we need to have the actor say something, like in Shakespeare's time, we need to have them have a soliloquy so that they can express all the things that they're thinking in their head. So there's no question as to what's going on in their mind, right? So um, in older plays, we, don't, we see a lack of subtext. People always say what they mean and mean what they say um, in classical pieces. But in a modern world where we're trying to duplicate reality a bit more in the way real human people communicate, we get this idea of subtext. And um, it is where we you know, communicate in a way that's very familiar to us, where sometimes we say things and we don't mean them, right? We mean something completely different. We also get a subgenre of tragedy um, in the early 19th century called melodrama. Now, from your textbook, we see that melodrama is historically a distinct form of drama popular throughout the 19th century, which emphasized action and spectacular effects and used stock characters. I'm sorry. In, um, sorry, I lost my place. Which emphasized action and spectacular effects and used music to heighten the dramatic mood. Melodrama had stock characters and clearly divine villains and heroes. More generally, the term is applied to any dramatic play which presents an unambiguous confrontation between good and evil. Characterization is often shallow and stereotypical, and because the moral conflict is externalized, action and violence are prominent, usually culminating in a happy ending meant to demonstrate the eventual triumph of good. So what's the difference between melodrama and tragedy? Well, melodrama is exaggerated and sometimes even laughable in its extremity, Tragedy is often more honest and taken seriously. Melodrama is often suspenseful, deals in the world of spectacle and stereotypical characters, whereas tragedy um, is often um, about kind of deep emotional turmoil, less dis, you know, honest portrayals of characters, and um, is, might have spectacle as a part of it, but only in terms of um, generating empathy for the protagonist. A modern example of melodrama would be soap operas, right? Um, and actually there's even TV shows that seem to fall into that, that category now that aren't soap operas, but this kind of very larger than life, over the top exaggeration, clear good guys, clear bad guys, good versus evil, right? All of those things. All right, we're gonna move on to comedy now. Comedy is the next big umbrella genre. And your textbook says, a play, comedy is a play that is light in tone, is concerned with issues tending not to be serious, has a happy ending, and is a designed to amuse and provoke laughter, right? So, just, sorry, one second. So, comedies have been around since the Greeks. They didn't have comedy at first, actually. They only had tragedy. And then it was some years later they decided that comedy would also be a good thing to have. Um, and there was very different rules for comedies. One of the things that Aristotle says is that a comedy should always be um, about 
the, the heroes, the protagonists, should always be people of low-born or common nature, right? Meaning that in comedy, at least according to the classical rules, we never have main characters that are high-born, meaning aristocrats, kings, queens, lords, ladies, gods or deities, right? We always have people that are just average, low-born folks, right? There's two reasons for this. One is that there was um, an just a innate knowledge that you should not make fun of gods because they might strike you dead, right? And also you should probably not make fun of kings or queens or people that had enormous power because they might come and have you arrested and you'd be, end up dead too. So we don't make fun of those people, right? We don't want to put them in s situations that are silly or ridiculous. Secondly, there was a feeling that gods and aristocrats and these high-born people these are people that could really experience these tragic events in these sweeping epic things in ways that normal people couldn't, right? There's a little bit of this still left with us today, right? When we look at our celebrities or we look at, um, you know, even some of the monarchs that are still the, the Prince Andrews and Meghan Merkels of the world now, that these people really experience things in ways or are special in a way that we aren't, right? And so they live lives that are just far beyond, you know, and it's more than just that they have money and power. It's that they really are kind of special, unique people. Um, that might or might not be true, but if you expand that idea and we go back a few thousand years, this is the reason why the Greeks never wrote comedies about these kinds of people, because there was really something special about them. And those people could experience like tragic things, but we would never want to make fun of them or belittle them, and besides, they were just so beyond, they were just so cool, really, that they would never be in these ridiculous situations that comedies ask us to look at. Well, what are some of the key elements of comedies, aside from these things that we just talked about over here, which is that they need to be light in tone, right? They are concerned with issues that tend not to be serious, and they have happy endings that usually ev evoke amusement or laughter. Well, one of the really important things is that they're non-realistic. Um, they do not follow the laws of nature, right? So audiences must be detached and aware of an artificial world where the laws of nature are suspended. And this is what allows the comic premise to be accepted. So one of the examples I always like to make when we talk about how does this work in, in the modern world and in modern storytelling is for those of you that have seen The Hangover, if you haven't, you might still be familiar with this scene, right? So in The Hangover, we have a group. This is a comedy, right? This is a classic <laughs> modern comedy. Um, in The Hangover, we have this group of guys that go to Las Vegas for a bachelor party. Things go terribly wrong because one of the guys who's a real idiot, played by Zach Galifianakis, basically roofies everybody unintentionally. I think unintentionally. And, and everybody kind of blacks out, and they don't remember a bunch of things that happened during the night when they wake up. They're in this really ridiculous situation where they're in this suite in Las Vegas, but the groom, the guy who's going to get married in just like 24, 48 hours, is completely missing from the room. And all of these crazy things are in the room, like a tiger in the bathroom and a baby in the closet, right? All of these things. And so now these group of guys are on this journey, right, to find the missing groom and to figure out what happened and get him back so that he can be on time for his wedding, right? This is the basic premise. So right up in the beginning of the film, we obviously set up that this is a comedy that people um, you know, are operating against the laws of nature. And that is what allows us to, at this particular moment, once they've already found the baby in the closet, right? Zach Galifianakis is definitely the um, least intelligent of all the guys there, uh, kind of takes the baby under his wing. And there's a moment after they've had breakfast where they're going to go out and they're going to try to find their friend. And Zach Galifianakis' character has the baby in a baby carrier. Some of you may have seen there's like stickers of this now. The baby's wearing sunglasses, has a little beanie on, right? Very cute baby. And the baby's in this baby carrier, and they call a cab to come and get them. And uh, Zach Galifianakis, because he's never worn a baby before, right, opens the car of the taxi right into the baby's face, right? And the baby gets smacked. We don't actually see it. We see, you know, the over-the-shoulder shot of it happening, the door coming towards them. We know, we hear the sound, we hear the baby crying, right? And in the film, this is a completely hysterical, very, very funny moment, right? People laughing, dying with laughter because this poor innocent baby has been hit in the head. 
So the reason why I like to use this example is for a couple reasons. If you think about any other moment that you can imagine in your life, if you saw a baby get hit in the head with a door so hard that it was crying, your reaction would not be laughter, unless you're a psychopath, right? Your reaction would be horror, and you'd be running over, and you'd feel sad, and you'd be worried for the baby, right? But because we're in a comedy, and we've already established that the rules of nature, the laws of nature do not apply, As an audience, we are allowed to laugh at something that would be normally in any other circumstance a really, really horrific thing to see, right? A really terrifying thing to see. We are allowed to find it funny. And that's for a couple reasons. Because we know that the baby is actually not hurt at all, right? We know that the baby is going to be absolutely 100% okay when we see the baby again, right? And in fact, the filmmakers will reinforce this idea Why when we see the baby, even though it might look kind of upset and crying, there's no blood gushing out of the baby's face. There's no giant gash. Um, The baby doesn't get a big bruise on its head at some point. You know, the baby doesn't, you know, have a concussion and have to go to the hospital. The baby just cries. And the next time we see the baby, the baby looks fine. Look, see, the baby's fine. (laughs) It's totally fine. It's fine the rest of the entire film. Nothing bad happens to the baby. And that's why... We can laugh at it because we know that. Now, again, going back to this example, imagine how differently you would have felt if you watched that film for the first time. You see the baby get hit. The filmmakers have already established that this is a comedy, so you feel free to laugh. But then what if the filmmakers had swung around and the next shot you see of the baby, the baby has a really realistic gash and is like seizing up and has a seizure or something because it has a concussion. You'd be horrified. And you'd probably be really confused as to whether or not this is supposed to be funny or not funny, right? So filmmakers and storytellers, when they are crafting a comedy, um, have that knowledge deeply embedded in their mind. Now, it's not that they're always thinking of it. It's just something that we accept when we're telling comedic stories. These are the things that have to happen. And audience members don't feel all right laughing at things if you haven't established that early on in the film, right? If at any moment in that film we had seen someone genuinely get hurt or be genuinely in pain or people around them react in a way that seemed genuine, right? We suddenly would have been very confused about the tone of the film and then we would not have felt okay laughing at those other moments. So... These kinds of rules are already set up and built into comedies. And because we accept them and we innately know them to be true through the cues that the filmmaker gives us as as well as just what we know about comedies, we feel like we can laugh at these things. And what that allows us to do is to laugh at things that might normally be really, really tragic. And what Aristotle said is that that's actually good for us. It's good for us to be able to reframe things that might sometimes be something that would be awful, but then look at it from a different perspective and actually find humor and lightness in it. So comedies really serve this kind of other purpose is that it allows us to release tension through laughter and then also to become aware of our own weaknesses, right? Um, And to reframe things through the lens of this kind of comedic perspective. In your textbook, um, Nichols also says that comedy keeps people humble, balanced, and human by deriding stupidity, hypocrisy, and pretension. And my goodness, if there is, you know, the hangover is a great example of that, right? We get to laugh at these people who act like idiots. There's no pretension in the film, right? There's no sense of like, I'm so much better than this, and I'm so much smarter than all of this, right? Um, We do away with all those things, and in watching it and engaging in those storytelling experiences, we also internalize those ideas um, and get to um, revel in them as well. So what are some of the techniques of comedy? Well, there are a couple different. There's verbal humor as well as uh, plot complications, Um, and there's also physical comedy that that we can use. So verbal humor is um, using language to be funny through wit, repartee, malaprops, malapropisms, puns, stigmithia. Um, It's saying things in a funny way, confusing words, 
um, using puns, words that sound like other words to be funny. We can also have plot complications that happen. Again, hangover, really good example, right? We have this complication that happens where everyone blacks out when they wake up. Oh my God, there's all of these crazy things and they have to figure out how they got into the situation and find their friend. Um, mistaken identity is another one that's commonly used. Um, and we've also had uh, different styles and genres of, of comedy evolve over the years. Comedy of manners is one of them. Your textbook defines comedy of manners as a cultivated world with witty dialogue and characters with social polish. Um, it's intellectual in its appeal, unlike farce. Um, one of the, you know, there are lots of books that also were written kind of in this style that then were turned into plays and films later. One that's coming out kind of um, soon, I think, yeah, this month, Emma, right? So Emma is um, a book that was written by, I believe, Jane Austen, you know, back in the 19th century. And um, it's been turned into a film many, many times. But if you see that film, one of the things you're going to realize is that what's humorous about it isn't so much that it has all this physical comedy or it uses necessarily, it does have some interesting plot points. But what's really funny about it is the way that people use language in the film and their cleverness, right? So it's a very, in, it's, it's a humor of the intellect that's used. Um, okay, sorry. Someone has actually typed in. So I'm going to go down, we're going to talk about farce a little bit, and then I'm going to catch Diana, who's just typed in for double extra credit today. Yay, Diana. So farce is kind of the opposite of comedy of manners, and here we have the textbook saying that farce is humor based primarily in physical activity and visual effects, relies less on higher forms of language and wit, uses violence, rapid movement, and accelerating pace, and these are all characteristics of farce, and we also consider this low comedy, whereas comedy of manners and intellectual comedy is considered high comedy, oftentimes we call this low comedy. Um, and so farce is more about physical humor, it uses slapstick, right, people slipping on bananas, fart jokes, all those things <laughs> happen in um, farcical things, um, it's very, very quickly paced. Um, in some ways, the hangover fits into that, that criteria, right? There is even a case of mistaken identity, actually, in the hangover. Um, where, again, something like the film that's coming out, Emma, is much more a comedy of manners. It deals with the intellect. It might have some clever pop plot points. But, again, there are these intellectual points of cleverness that have us laughing at, um, you know, the way people say things or funny little twists um, that happen rather than pe someone falling on their face or a baby getting a door knocked into their face, right? Okay, so Diana has a comment here. She says a question, which is uh, the most watched today or popular, tragedy or comedy or both? Um, you know, I don't have any statistics on what I think is, or just, you know, oh no, I went away. I hope you can still hear my voice. There we are. <laughs> um, sorry about that, guys. So I don't know exactly, you know, it'd be interesting to look up, you know, are, are comedies more, more popular than tragedies? My guess would be that people tend to go to see uh, things that are comedies and more like action films than they do like dramas, and that's just because people like to feel happier more than they like to feel sad. Um, I'm also not sure as to what is produced more um, in terms of film uh, and television. But uh, I think that each one has its own interesting thing to give to us, right? Comedy allows us to kind of see the world through this comic lens and through lightness and to reframe things and to laugh at ourselves, whereas tragedy is asking us to kind of empathize and express our, and uh, try to understand our humanity a little better through sort of dramatic events and through oftentimes what are the struggles that we face as human beings and how can we become better people um, once we've, you know, struggled through those things. So I think each one has its own benefits and its own um, things that it teaches us. And I'm not really sure. The Diana, that's a great question. Um, maybe I'll look it up and we'll talk about it on here next time. You got your, your double points of extra credit, so good for you. All right, we've just got a tiny bit left of class now in this last uh, 
20 minutes of class, we're going to take a quick look at V for Vendetta. So we're going to move on from tragedy and comedy, and we're going to look a little bit at this film. Um, so the film is a political thriller by the makers of The Matrix, the Wachowski brothers, uh, now the Wachowski sisters, I believe. Um, but we're going to take a look a little bit. We're going to just jump ahead if we can. The screenplay was by, um, at the time, they identified as Andy and Larry Wachowski. It was based on the graphic novel by David Lloyd and written by Alan Moore. It was directed by James McTeague with Hugo Weaving as V and Natalie Portman um, and Stephen Rhea, Stephen Fry, and John Hurt. Hugo Weaving, excuse me one second, is also in The Matrix. He plays uh, Mr. Smith, right? So the guy who is, ends up being Neo's nemesis. He's also in The Lord of the Rings. He plays the elder elf, the father of the one elf. Oh, I can't remember <laughs> what their names were. But anyways, he's in both of those films. He's just, had a, a really good streak in the early uh, 2000s where he was just in a ton of things. Um, so we're going to just take a quick look at a few clips from the film and uh, as we're looking at these clips, I really want us to think about a couple things, right? We're learning about how we've learned a lot about film today and the history of film. We learned about tragedy and comedy and what are some of the markers of that. So as we're watching this, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this film, but I want us to ask ourselves some questions. First of all, is the tone of this film, does it strike us as being more tragic or dramatic in nature? Or does it strike us as being more comedic? And whichever one we think it is, why? Why do we think it is? Are we seeing that the laws of nature don't apply? Are we seeing that this is light in tone and not serious? Or are we seeing the opposite, serious in tone, um, high stakes, all of these things, right? Secondly, I'd like us to play, pay attention to the language of filmmaking. How is the filmmaker choosing to tell this story visually through the type of shots that he or she is using and the way that they're compiling those shots or putting them together so that one moment flows to the next moment, one shot flows to the next shot to tell a continuous story. Um, so let's try to pay attention to those things and let's see if we can identify some of the shots that are being used in this opening sequence, as well as whether or not we feel this is a, a drama, dramatic piece, or a comic piece. So we're gonna just look quickly at the opening here of V for Vendetta. Great. So I think one of the things that becomes incredibly apparent is just the very serious tone of the film, right? From the very beginning, right? We get this black screen with just Natalie Portman's voice, Evie's voice over it. Um, she's quoting the little nursery rhyme for, um, that was created for Guy Fox, and she explains the story of Guy Fox. While she's saying the story of Guy Fox, we see on the screen this flashback basically taking us back to the moment of Guy Fox and showing us visually what he did while she sets up what's about to happen because we're certainly not in you know the uh, 17th century with Guy Fox we're way 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 ahead into the into the future in a different time um, but it sets up the corollary between those two things so Guy Fox was a rebel um, who wanted to blow up the Houses of Parliament because he felt that they were corrupt and um, uh, not doing things for the people, right? Um, he was standing against this authoritarian government, and he was going to destroy it. Now, he got caught. He didn't get to blow up the Houses of Parliament, and he was charged with treason, and he was hung. And that's true. That really happened, right, in England. Um, so we get this, you know, this very kind of, and we see a man hung from the gallows. And you saw all those people watching. Remember I was saying earlier in the episode, people used to go and watch people get executed quite regularly, not just hanging, get their heads chopped off, right? Um, so we see this and it sets up a very, very dark tone. And when we see Guy Fox get hung, we see his wife, that's who they pan to, right? They, they do this the pan to her and you see her standing there and that was his wife in, in the um, crowd. And we see she genuinely looks upset. So we already know that this is not a comedy, right? There's nothing light. There's nothing funny. This guy really died, right? He doesn't get to walk away from the, take the rope off and walk away from the gallows at the end. So we definitely set up a tone of seriousness 
and the high stakes, life or death situations, right? And that's foreshadowing for what's going to happen later. She even says it, that she knows now, she understands that an idea can change the world and that some people could be willing to die for an idea or to be killed for an idea, right? So very, very high stakes here. Um, the other thing in terms of, of the, the, the shots that are taken, we get this very, again, we get this great black screen. That's purposeful, right? This kind of moment almost that's theatrical in nature where it's like the audience is sitting and the curtain hasn't risen yet. And all we hear is a voice in the darkness. But it also mirrors what's happening, right? We see the way that the light comes on is that we see, we hear the match get struck and then we see the candle and it's Guy Fox in the bowels of the, the Houses of Parliament, which would have all been dark, right? Because there was no electricity. Um, and he's had to light this candle. And so presumably he's been walking around kind of in the dark before this moment. And then with his candle illuminates and we see it. And it's a fairly tight shot, right? We see just the barrels. He was going to uh, light up a bunch of gunpowder. It's called, that's why it's also called the gunpowder plot, right? Because he took these barrels of gunpowder um, underneath there. He was going to light them, and that would have created a big explosion. So he's there with the gunpowder, and he's in these narrow passageways with just the, the candlelight, and then we see him getting caught. Again, these very tight shots, but that happened pretty, the cuts are pretty quick between each one. Um, and then we see him being led up to, to the gallows. We swing around. We see his wife's face. Um, all of these are fairly now wider shots that we move to, right, to kind of get a sense of the entire feeling. That last shot is interesting because it's a low angle shot. Um, right before he's getting hung, the camera is sort of below the subjects. So we're looking up and we can see not only the gallows, not only Guy Fawkes, not only the executioners at his side, but the Houses of Parliament behind, right? I don't know that he was actually hung in front of the Houses of Parliament, but it's a beautiful idea that... You know, the backdrop is the thing he intended to destroy, but he didn't. Um, he's actually now, he himself is going to go to his demise with this backdrop. The authority is still standing, and yet he's going to die, right? So kind of beautiful framing of all the ideas that we're going to see play out in this film um, later. I want to jump, we have really just enough time to go to one more clip, and this is where V meets Evie for the first time. This is Hugo Weaving's character. His name is V. And he speaks in poetry. He always speaks in poetry, and he also always wears a mask. It's a really unusual character to see in a modern film. Um, but uh, Hugo Weaving is so talented, he really, really uh, carries it all off. And we're now in what is the present of the film. And as we watch this, what, uh, some of the things I'd like us to think about, again, is how is the filmmaker choosing to tell the story through the types of shots that they're using? And let's also pay attention to Hugo Weaving, because here we have an actor who is being denied the primary tool of, especially an actor in, in, in film, which is his face. <laughs> we know that film is the medium of close-ups, and the close-up is going to be on the actor's face, and yet we've denied Hugo Weaving the ability to tell the story through his face because he's got a mask on. So let's pay attention to how he's able to communicate character and feeling through other parts of his body that aren't his face, and he really does a very good job. So let's pay attention to that. In this next clip, uh, V meets Evie. All right, so... That's the first time V meets Evie, and we get a kind of spectacular introduction to so we move to the next scene where he blows up the old Bailey. Um, so I just want to point out a few things, you know, thinking about how an actor can communicate character when he's masked the entire time and cinema is, you know, really about close-ups. We notice that um, Hugo Weaving uses his body a lot, right? And that means that the filmmaker can't always be in close-up in the way that they would with like Natalie Portman's character. So we see a lot of wider and more medium shots that are taken of him so we can really see his body. But even when they do move into those closer shots, what we notice is that Hugo Weaving is moving his head a lot and communicating character through his body and, and through all that 
in a way that you know you wouldn't normally as a film actor. In fact, film actors are told, and when I teach film acting, when we're in those close-ups, we really want to move our head as, as little as possible. It's all about expression and what's happening in the eyes. But because he doesn't have any of those things, he really does have to move his head around. The lighting of the scene as well helps to create interest, whereas we might, you know, typically the interest would be created, again, by the expressions and the emotions that the actor is emoting. Here we have to create interest in other ways, and they do that a lot through light and shadow and the way that they kind of create, you know, sometimes he's in this silhouette and sometimes his face is in half shadow so that we're still getting some sort of interest in, in the way that we're seeing his character. Um, obviously, his language is incredibly heightened. He speaks in this very, very poetic fashion, and as, of course, we get further along into the story, we begin to understand why that is um, and, and why that's happening. Um, and again, the shots are composed in such a way to create a really nice sense of piecing. Um, you know, nothing truly radical happening except that we do have to sort of frame uh, Hugo Weaving's character V in really different ways because he is wearing a mask and this big cloak and he, it doesn't, we don't have the normal things that we would have to create interest and empathy and connection with the actors. All right, I do see that Daniel has typed in. We don't have time to read or answer your question, but Daniel, I've written your name down. You're going to get your extra credit for today. Thank you to also anyone else who wrote in today. Um, that is all that we have time for today, guys. Um, we, we aren't going to be able to watch any more of V, but please, it's a great film. If you have the time, go and see it on your own. There aren't any questions or uh, test questions about it, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, this week, you do still have, you have a test that you need to take by Sunday, and you do have a discussion board that you need to do by Sunday at midnight as well. And I know that some of you had some problems with your quiz um, last week. I'll go and check on that again and see if I can figure out what it was, if it was just specific to a few individuals, or again, maybe I'm missing something. It was something bigger that was happening with the, the test. But thank you so much for tuning in today. We went through a lot of material. Thank you for the two people that typed in. It's always fun when you guys type in and um, I can hear what you're thinking or what your questions are, even if it's not answering the question of the day. And um, we will be here again next week with week four, continuing on with learning about television, film, and theater. And I look forward to seeing you then. And we will go ahead and tune out for now. Thanks so much, guys, and I'll see you next time.